Hello and welcome to the Euthanasia PowerPoint. Uh, today we will be covering basic concepts in euthanasia and some of the philosophical arguments just in outline. Basic concepts. The most basic concept we're, we will deal with is the idea of euthanasia itself. I find the uh, etymology of this to be actually kind of amusing. Uh, uh, euthanasia is from the Greek. The prefix eu, E-U, means good, and <coughs> thanatos means death, so um, uh, euthanasia is a good death. For the Greeks, a good death was typically a death in battle, often in circumstances that would exemplify the values of your life. For instance, if you died defending the temple of your family's God, that would be a very good death. These days, we prefer to die quietly at home, asleep. To really understand um, the ethics of euthanasia, you have to be begin to parse out lots of different kinds of euthanasia. Uh, begin to classify situations. And the one way to do this is to talk about lo a level of activity. Now, the most basic distinction in euthanasia debates is the uh, distinction between active and passive euthanasia. Active euthanasia is t occurs when you take a positive action that ends someone's life. A lethal injection. Right? Um, giving them a lethal dose of any kind of drug. Uh, passive euthanasia is the failure to perform an action that would save someone's life. For instance, not performing CPR. In American law, the distinction between active and passive euthanasia is huge and very important. Active euthanasia is illegal. Passive euthanasia is universal. Anytime you sign a, a do not resuscitate order, you are agreeing to passive euthanasia. This distinction, though, is not as clear-cut as people would like it to be. Um, for instance, what happened with Terry Schiavo when feeding tubes were withdrawn is classified as passive euthanasia. But it doesn't look particularly passive at all. Um, that is, an, an action was taking place. So what we need to do is to distinguish more subtly the differences between doing things and allowing things to happen. One of the first distinctions that gets made is a distinction actually uh, from Catholic bioethics. Uh, Catholic theologians have been making this distinction since the 16th century. This is the distinction between extraordinary and ordinary care. Um, ordinary care is anything cheap and readily available, such as antibiotics um, for an infection, or just, you know, bandaging a wound. Anything that you could do automatically as a matter of course. Extraordinary care is anything expensive or difficult to maintain or obtain, like open heart surgery. Uh, and here, expense includes problems with side effects. So chemotherapy is considered extraordinary care. Um, the drugs are expensive, but more importantly, the side effects have a big toll. Um, so what counts as extraordinary care will vary with time and place. Uh, in Africa, antibiotics are actually extraordinary care because antibiotics are hard to come by. Um, they are expensive in, in, for African economies. Another possibly important distinction is the distinction between withholding care and withdrawing care. Some people think that, it, it, that once, you have once you have begun to do something, if you stop doing it, that makes, that is more of an action than simply having refrained from doing it in the first place. So withholding care would be something like obeying a DNR order. You know, you, you read that the patient does not want to be resuscitated, and you decide not to resuscitate them. Withdrawing care involves stopping a procedure once it has begun. So this would be something like removing a ventilator, 
we're removing a feeding tube. You've got to take, in some sense, a physical action in order to do this. And so it seems more like, um, it seems more active than straightforward passive euthanasia. You also need to distinguish between two ways of actively ending life. Uh, one is assisted suicide. Assisted suicide, or physician-assisted suicide, occurs when the doctor gives the patient the means to end their own life. Uh, so this, this is actually legal in Oregon, in the United States. Doctors are allowed to write a prescription for a lethal dose of painkillers. The patient can then fill this prescription, and uh, when they feel like the time has come, they can take the prescription. They can take the drugs. This is different than full-blown active euthanasia. This occurs when the doctor directly kills someone. This is what is legal in the Netherlands. So this would invo this is full-blown active euthanasia it would include things like giving patients lethal injections, um, that sort of thing. We can actually put all of these concepts together and, uh, and essentially rank them from the most passive to the most active. So the most passive thing to do would be to withhold extraordinary care. Um, this would be something like deciding not to undergo another round of chemotherapy. This is the sort of thing that nearly everyone agrees is legitimate. And, and in, in the end, most people do if they are facing a long slow decline, they will at some point have to say, no, I don't want to take this extraordinary measure to extend my life. Uh, the next step up would be to withdraw extraordinary care. Things like removing ventilators count as this. Um, you can move forward to ordinary care. Obeying a DNR order or not treating an infection with antibiotics are the two most common ways to withhold ordinary care. And this is, uh, both of these are practiced extensively in U.S. hospitals. Withdrawing ordinary care would be a situation where you had been attempting to lengthen a life and then you decide that that, that is no longer worthwhile. So anytime you switch to palliative care only, if, if, you, if you make the decision to switch to palliative care, you are withdrawing ordinary care. Now the next two steps are something I've separated out. Um, I've, and I haven't mentioned this before, but um, I'm separating out food and water because there's something particularly upsetting about seeing someone uh, die from dehydration or starve to death. So um, I've got a separate category here for um, feeding tubes, essentially. Withholding food and water would be something like deciding not to insert a feeding tube. Withdrawing food and water involves taking out a feeding tube. This would be something like the Shivo case. Um, notice that this is almost all the way to the point of assisted suicide. This is, this is extremely active. Um, philosophically, morally, psychologically. When you cross the line into full-blown, and when you cross the line into genuine active euthanasia, you're talking about assisted suicide and full-blown active euthanasia. So assisted suicide uh, would be things like allowing doctors to prescribe a lethal dose of painkillers, what, what they do in Oregon. And then full-blown active euthanasia is allowing doctors to give lethal injections. You thought we were done making distinctions? No. There are still many, many more distinctions to make. We've got uh, a whole lot of circumstances to deal with. We need to think about different aspects of them. So previously I was talking about sort of how active you are in, in hastening the death of a patient. We can also talk about varieties of consent. Um, the most straightforward kind of consent is voluntary, full-blown, you know, just full voluntary euthanasia. This happens when the patient is conscious and competent and asks to die. 
many euthanasia circumstances are not cases of voluntary euthanasia. They are uh, non-voluntary. This happens when the patient is either unconscious or incompetent, so a proxy, such as a family member, has to authorize euthanasia. Now, non-voluntary euthanasia has to be distinguished from involuntary euthanasia. Uh, involuntary euthanasia is when the pa patient is conscious and competent and doesn't want to die. This is known as mur murder. This doesn't happen. So we'll ignore that from now on. Um, I, I put that up here only to emphasize that non-voluntary is not involuntary. And from now on, we will only worry about non-voluntary. OK. Once you have a proxy giving consent uh, in a non-voluntary situation, we can distinguish two kinds of situations. Proxies can um, give, base, give their consent on the basis of a prior directive, like a living will. Um, if a patient has written that they do not want to be resuscitated in certain circumstances, that's a form of, of, of proxy consent by prior directive. On the other hand, um, there may be cases where the patient has not left any directives, or perhaps is an infant and never had the capacity to write a directive, in which case the proxy has to give consent on the basis of the patient's best interest. We can put all this together and get a, and, and get a chart. So what I've done here is I've listed across the top um, various levels of activeness. And then on the left-hand side, varieties of consent, voluntary, non-voluntary with a prior directive, and non-voluntary based on best interest. Um, you can think about euthanasia regulations as s simply filling in boxes on this form, deciding which varieties of euthanasia are sometimes acceptable. So let's look at some examples. Traditional Catholic bioethics allows only for um, the withholding or withdrawing of extraordinary care. So as you can see, what is allowed are just the boxes on the left in green. Um, this is, in fact, why the distinction between ordinary and extraordinary care is very important in, Catholic, in the Catholic tradition. It marks the difference between acceptable and unacceptable euthanasia. U.S. law is much more permissive regarding euthanasia. Um, in fact, US, U.S. law allows for anything that might possibly be classified as passive euthanasia. This includes withholding or withdrawing any sort of care, um, including food and water. And you can do this either with the patient's direct consent or with the consent of a proxy. The two places which are infamous for having a more permissive attitude towards euthanasia are Oregon and the Netherlands. Um, Oregon has filled in one little green box um, in the assisted suicide category. Note, by the way, that um, assisted, with assisted suicide, you can't have proxy consent. Proxy consent simply doesn't make sense. You, know, you are, if you are assisting in someone's suicide, they have to be the one who is taking the active, the ultimate measure to kill themselves. The Netherlands uh, goes beyond that and l allows for full-blown, voluntary, active euthanasia. The law presumably allows for assisted suicide as well. However, most of the infamous cases in the Netherlands are about full-blown, voluntary, active euthanasia. As you saw in the reading on the Benta Hendricks case in the Groningen Protocol, when the law was originally passed, a heavy emphasis was placed on, actually it was a regulation decriminalizing euthanasia, but a heavy emphasis was placed on the voluntariness of it. And, ver and versions of non-voluntary euthanasia were explicitly um, ruled out. If the Groningen Protocol were to go through, however, this would add yet another green box to the um, 
uh, to the range of allowable forms of euthanasia in the Netherlands. In fact, this would only forbid non-voluntary active euthanasia on the basis of a prior directive. And to be quite honest, I, I don't see once you allow best interest non-voluntary euthanasia why you wouldn't allow prior directive non-voluntary euthana active euthanasia. It is, um, it's actually a fairly profound illustration of a slippery slope. That is, sometimes, sometimes sl slopes really are slippery. That is, sometimes allowing one thing will lead to allowing another, and then another, and another. Uh, if you've had a logic course in the past, you may have heard the slippery slope argument referred to as a fallacy. And certainly there are many illegitimate slippery slope arguments. I think euthanasia is one case where um, it looks like slippery slope arguments aren't just legitimate, but they have been borne out in practice. I want to discuss two philosophical arguments from your textbook, one from James Rachels and the other from Daniel Callahan. The James Rachels article is a genuine classic in the literature. His thesis is very simple. He says that there is no moral difference between active and passive euthanasia. He's got three arguments for this. Um, one is uh, the pain argument, and one is the bad grounds for decision argument. These are pretty straightforward arguments that had been seen before. The truly original argument was the drowning thought experiment. This is what made the article famous. Sometimes this gets called the drowning analogy. I think it is misleading to call it an analogy, and we'll call it a thought experiment for reasons that will become clear later. So here are the first two. They are... Um, uh, well, we'll just hit them quickly. Um, the pain argument's pretty simple, really. Passive euthanasia is slow and painful, and active euthanasia is quick and easy. Furthermore, both forms of euthanasia have the same outcome. We have a general duty to, to relieve pain. Therefore, if anything, active euthanasia is preferable. So notice the way I've, I've laid out this argument. Um, the first three points are premises. And given the truth of those premises, we infer the truth of the conclusion, line four. Um, he also has what, what, what we call the bad grounds for decision argument. And the thrust of this argument is simply that if you make a distinction between active and passive euthanasia, then wh who has access to euthanasia is determined by... Um, illegitimate grounds, frequently who has complicating factors and who doesn't. So his example is an infant born with Down syndrome and intestinal blockage. Such an infant might be euthanized under, under the law as it stands. Um, now the real reason for this euthanasia is the Down syndrome. But if we only allow passive euthanasia, only the babies who happen to have an intestinal blockage will be euthanized. It seems like we're being we're making this arbitrary distinction amongst Down syndrome babies. Some live and some die. Who, who dies? The ones who happen to have a random, com completely treatable intestinal blockage. That is simply not a decent grounds for making a decision. Well, if that's the case, then we should allow active euthanasia because it will allow us to make decisions uh, more rationally. Rachel's most famous argument from this paper is a thought experiment about uh, two men, two cases of a man drowning a small boy. Um, the idea of the thought experiment was to set up a contrast between two cases where the only thing that's different in the two cases is that um, in one case the person acted and in the other case the person allowed something to happen. This is the sort of thought experiment that you engage in to isolate an individual intuition you have about morality. The cases are um, tailor-made so that everything is the same except for one factor. And in that sense, they are like experiments in science. In, in an experiment in science, you have a 
control group and an experimental group. And the only thing that's supposed to be different about them is the presence of, say, the drug you're testing. In this case, the only thing that's different about these two cases is the presence of action. Okay. So, first case. A man drowns a child in a tub for the inheritance money. Second case. A man decides to drown a child in the tub for the inheritance money, but finds that the child is already drowning, so he lets the child die. Um, it looks like, in this case, both men are equally guilty. So if this were a, a clinical trial, there would be no difference between the behavior of the, b between the results with the experimental group and with the control group. Um, now, if there are no differences in the results between the experimental group and the control group, there is no, the, the drug is not effective. Similarly, if there, there's, there's no difference here, that means that the distinction between acting and not acting doesn't make a moral difference. Well, if it doesn't make a moral difference here, then it doesn't make a moral difference in the case of euthanasia. Therefore, there is no moral difference between actively killing and passively allowing someone to die. Now, it's important to note that this he is not saying that euthanasia is analogous to drowning someone in a tub. He's not asserting any similarity between drowning a drowning child, uh, in, drowning a child intentionally in a tub, and any sort of mercy killing. The point of the experiment is, the thought experiment, is merely that we isolate the distinction between, between doing and allowing to happen. All right, now there's one final objection that he talks about that's worth going into. Um, people will often say that in active euthanasia, the doctor is the cause of the killing, and in passive euthanasia, something else is the cause of death. This is, in fact, what we'll see Callahan argue in a second. Rachel's reply here is that the doctor does do something in the case of passive euthanasia. He lets the person die. And this, this, here's a nice analogy. This is an action the same way that not shaking someone's hand can be an insult. On to Callahan. Callahan makes four major claims in his paper. Self-determination does not justify act active euthanasia. There is a moral difference between killing and letting die. Legalized euthanasia will have bad consequences. This is the slippery slope argument. And euthanasia is incompatible with the mission of doctors. All right. Um, no consensual killing. This is the argument that uh, your autonomy, your right to self-determination, does not allow for euthanasia. It's essentially an argument by analogy. He um, is pointing out that people who believe in personal autonomy make exceptions. And one exception is the idea of a consensual killing. So, John Stuart Mill uh, said flat out that your personal autonomy does not give you the right to sell yourself into slavery. You can imagine a hypothetical situation where uh, someone needs money for their family. Say their sister needs an operation. And the only way to raise that money would be to sell themselves into slavery. And after, so this would be like their last autonomous act on Earth, would be to give up their autonomy. Mill says that this is not an, a legitimate use of autonomy. It's not protected. You, can't be, you cannot be allowed to do that. Another example, uh, dueling. <laughs> Once upon a time, it was legal and even common for men to challenge each other to duels. Um, our founding fathers fought duels with each other. Well, it was banned in the 19th century. 
Um, and it was banned because um, it was felt that you cannot use your autonomy to give away your life. Um, uh, a similar example came up actually in Germany recently. A rather perverse case occurred where a man put out a classified ad um, offering, the r offering anyone the right to kill him um, and eat him. And someone took him up on this ad and then um, he was brought. He was found. He was brought before the court and found guilty of murder, even though he he defended himself by saying, "Look, this man consented to be murdered by me." Well, the idea is that in all of these cases, you can't really consent to be killed. Um, we have strong intuitions in those cases. Well, if we have strong intuitions in those cases, then clearly we um, uh, shouldn't allow e euthanasia either, since euthanasia is simply a form of consensual killing. Callahan also has an extended dis discussion of why killing is different from letting die. Um, I've looked at this and looked at this, and I'm not actually sure there's an argument here, but he does make some important distinctions. One important distinction he makes, the, the important distinction he makes is between causality and culpability. Causality is a physical notion. One set of circumstances gives rise to another. Typically, a any event you encounter will have multiple causes. So, why, di why did this car crash occur? Well, it may have occurred, be you can say it occurred because the driver was drunk, but perhaps also the intersection was badly designed so you couldn't see around the corner. I if both of those situations occur, you can have multiple causes for the same event, and who you hold responsible really depends on context. Um, so you would hold, the, in some cases, you would hold the driver responsible, but you might also want to talk to the person who failed to, to trim the hedges that blocked the intersection. So every event has multiple causes, and th these are unrelated to culpability. Some kinds of cause, causes are, some kinds of causal agents are culpable and others are not. Culpability is a moral notion. This happens when a person is deemed responsible for an outcome. Callahan makes a bunch of claims about culpability and causality. I don't think they add up to an argument. What he says is that the cause of death in passive euthanasia is always the disease. I am, I'm actually kind of skeptical about that because it seems to me that you can never isolate a single cause for any event. Uh, uh, any event is the collaboration of a variety of causes. In a sense, everything that happens is a perfect storm because everything that happens happens for a whole bunch of reasons. All right. Callahan maintains that culpability for death in the case of passive euthanasia is a matter of context. So the doctor might be responsible, but he might not be. And really what Callahan is hit, leaning t hinting towards here is the, is the Catholic distinction between, a between extraordinary and ordinary measures. So the doctor may still be culpable for the death um, in the case of passive euthanasia, even if he isn't the cause, because he failed to give ordinary care. On the other hand, in active euthanasia, um, the cause is always the doctor and the culpable party is always the doctor, at least according to Callahan. I don't actually see an argument for this. That's just what he states. Finally, we get to the slippery slope argument. Um, I mentioned before that slippery slope arguments are sometimes described as fallacies, that is, always mistakes in reasoning. However, uh, there are many cases where slippery slope arguments are actually legitimate. Sometimes a legitimate slippery slope argument is called 
an argument from consequences. That's actually what Callahan labels his argument here um, in order to avoid association with the term slippery slope, which is associated with bad arguments. All right. So here's the slippery slope argument. Basically, what he does is he gives several reasons to, for us to believe that the slope in question is very slippery. Let me backtrack. A slippery slope argument occurs when someone says, well, we could do this, but then, leading to this, but then doing this will lead to that and that and that and that, and then pretty soon we'll be doing something awful. So the, the classical way of phrasing it is saying, well, the, we're just on a slippery slope to whatever. Um, in this case, the, s the, the bottom of the slope would be some sort of unjustified killing. And often people who, who invoke this argument will go all the way to the Nazis and say, well, we'll just wind up killing off all the disabled people the way the Nazis tried to. Um, and it is true, you know, the first group that was rounded up and gassed by the Nazis weren't Jews, gypsies, or homosexuals. They were people with disabilities. So that's the bottom of the slope. And the claim is that once you start allowing some form of euthanasia, you're on the road to that sort of awful outcome. Slippery slope arguments, I maintain, are sometimes legitimate. In order to, for them to be legitimate, though, you have to prove that the slope is, is genuinely slippery. And oftentimes, I think, when people invoke slippery slope arguments, they um, are really talking about implausible circumstances. Um, so people will say that, for instance, a ban on a certain sort of handgun will lead to Nazi Germany. Oh, come on, it's not going to. Well, um, Callahan has some pretty compelling evidence that um, the slope with euthanasia genuinely is slippery. Perhaps the most compelling evidence that he can point to is practical experience. The Dutch experience is what he mentions. Um, it's also um, other work has been done looking at uh, uh, quasi-legalization of euthanasia in Switzerland and you see a similar slippery effect. Um, when you legalize euthanasia, abuses occur. He also points to the difficulty in writing laws that are clear and the difficulty in um, pinning down the moral concepts involved. And he says that all of these let us know that the slope is slippery. Um, legalized euthanasia will probably lead to abuse. Since we shouldn't enact laws that will be abused, we should not legalize euthanasia. Um, in some ways, what, he, what, he, what you're left with here is an empirical argument. You're left with an argument about the facts in the world. Uh, something is empirical if it relates to experience, if it's something that you can check scientifically. So the experience in the Netherlands um, is an example of sliding down a slippery slope. Interestingly, the experience in Oregon has been very different. Uh, Munson talks about this in some detail. It, one of the more interesting results about the experience in Oregon was that most prescriptions for lethal doses of painkillers go unused. This indicates, in fact, that rather than seeing a great big rush to euthanize, people in Oregon, at least, were still very reluctant to, to, to engage in something clo in, in close to active euthanasia. One question we can ask that I think is important is what makes the slope slippery in some cases and not others. All right. Callahan's final point is that euthanasia goes against medical practice. 
Um, and here we can see a lot, and it's, it, in this section we can see a lot of Callahan's fundamental value commitments. Basically, he says that dying patients are not in a position to judge the value of their lives, um, frequently because of depression, for instance. And doctors are not in a position to, uh, value, to, to evaluate the quality of someone's life. They can evaluate health, but they cannot make the moral, devi moral um, decision that someone, about someone's quality of life. So, um, this leads Callahan to say things like this. It's not medicine's place to lift from us the burden of that suffering which turns on the meaning which we assign the decay of the body and its eventual death. What he's saying here is how we face death is a spiritual, um, a spiritual experience for us. Doctors are not in a position to make this distinct, to, to tell us how to experience death. It's not medicine's place to determine when lives are worth living or not. Um, it's just the bottom line. Okay, I, c I think that's all we need to say about Callahan, uh, so we'll call this quits. <laughs>